So about five years ago exactly, I went on a road trip to the Yurok Reservation in Northern California. So just so you know some information about me, I'm from the Midwest. And so seeing the coastline, the redwoods, the dense forests, it was beautiful. It was amazing to me. But there was one site that stood out amongst the rest. It was Bigfoot. He was everywhere. He was in tiny signs. He was in memorabilia shops. There were whole museums dedicated to him. When I arrived to the Yurok Reservation, I brought it up to my hosts. I shared my amusement that Bigfoot had been everywhere, and they uh, firmly said to me, oh, no, 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 he's real. He's not just a story. He's a part of our community, and we have oral traditions about him that have gone on for thousands of years. I am from an indigenous community, and so oral traditions are something that have really been critical to the existence of my own tribe. Before this uh, encounter, I really thought that Bigfoot was a story, was a hoax. But after talking with the Yurok tribe, it really sat with me that this is something that I should be seriously considering. Was Bigfoot real? And what was the role of oral traditions in our communities, my community, uh, larger society? So what I wanna talk with you all about today are the ways that I think oral tradition really shows up in our communities. First, I think oral traditions can be these things that share these real factual truths from one generation to the next. So one story about this, um, Kennewick Man, he was, there was a skeleton found uh, on the bank of the Columbia River in 1996 in Washington. Uh, his name was Kennewick Man. Uh, science shows that his bones were about 9,000 years old, so one of the oldest skeletons that had been found up until that point. And quickly, scientists claimed that skeleton and said, we want to do research on it. And tribes in the area, the Colville tribe specifically said, no, 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 no. You can't do that. That's our ancestor. We want to bury him properly, and we want him to be at peace. Well, scientists quickly came back saying, there's no way your tribe was here 9,000 years ago. And furthermore, even if you were, there's no way you would know that this was your ancestor. Tribes came back again saying, we have oral tradition of us being in this area 9,000 years ago. We have oral tradition of this being a place in a way in which we would have buried our ancestors. So a whole legal battle ensued. Maybe unsurprisingly, the scientists won. In about 2015, new um, DNA research came out showing that Aha, the oral traditions were correct. The Colville uh, tribes were correct in saying that the Kennewick man was actually their ancestor. And so this sticks out as being a really important story to me because it shows that not only are oral traditions something we pass down from generation to generation, but there's something that can pass down real and factual truth for not just decades, not just centuries, but millennia. So that's the first takeaway I want you to have. The second, even when oral traditions aren't necessarily factual, they have really important lessons for us. So in my own community and in communities across the world, uh, we have stories about owls. Owls are like bad omens in a lot of communities. Like I know all of you are like, no, owls are wisdom, Athena, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> but like in so many communities, they're just like not great. And so in my own community, the Choctaw tribe, they're actually harbingers of death. Like if you hear an owl, somebody's either just died or you better keep an eye out on your family because somebody's not making it to the morning. And like scientifically, do I think that's accurate? Like if you were to put a study out that was like, okay, here are all the owls that we've heard, like how many people wind up dead the next day. I don't think you would find a scientific correlation, but there are enough communities across the world saying this about owls that like it leads one to wonder why we care so much, like what's happening around owls. And so owls are night birds, right? And they hunt at night. And you, if you're outside at night hearing an owl, you might be in an unsafe place, an unsafe situation, a place that we don't understand, right? And so our communities, create oral traditions, not only to share factual information from one generation to the next, but to provide cautions and warnings and to try to explain the unknown, which also has a lot of value. And so those are really the two ways that I see us using oral traditions in our communities. 
Now you might just think, oh, that's just for tribal communities. But nay, nay. Uh, you all, I'm sure, if you think about your own communities, have stories about ghosts or UFOs or the spooky local graveyard or that house you're not supposed to go by, right? And I would argue that those two are oral traditions that carry very similar information across our communities from one generation to the next. So, you know, which of these applies to Bigfoot, right? Like, is Bigfoot real and roaming out there and this is factual information? Maybe, that could be very true. Maybe it's an, an extinct animal that we no longer have information about. Or is Bigfoot a story that we create to talk about the dangers of the wilderness and when we need to be safe and create caution, uh, and have cautionary tales? That could also be true. That's not really what's important here. The takeaway that I want you to have is that these oral traditions mean something. We should pay attention to them, and they're critical to the existence of our communities. They shine a light on human existence and the ways that we pass information from one generation to the next. And I would really encourage you to look at your families, your communities, your hometowns, and see what information is being conveyed to you there. Thank you.